and uh, it's the kind of thing it's the kind of thing that makes you go what the hell <clears throat> Um, it's called the Intermediate Value Theorem. Sometimes it's called... Uh, what? Oof, can't talk and write. Um, sometimes it's called this one simple trick has mathematicians furious. Um, so here's here's what it says. Um, and then, I don't know, you tell me what you think. Uh, if F is continuous on a closed interval, so close means that it contains its endpoints. <clears throat> uh, so that means that it's continuous in the in all the interior points, and at A it's continuous on the left, and B it's continuous on the right. Um, it's F is continuous on a closed interval. Um, and n is any number between, I guess, n is an intermediate value between two values of f, the value of f at one endpoint, and the value of f at another endpoint. And what the theorem tells us is that there is a there is somewhere somewhere in this interval f of c equals m so that's what the theorem says um what is the theorem what is the theorem in a picture? In a picture, I have I have a, a function on a closed interval going from A to B, and it's continuous. And then I take the value at one at one end, so that's the y coordinate of the point on the graph, and the value at the other end point. And then I say n can be any value in between. And then it tells me that somewhere the value of the function equals this n. Uh, so that means that the graph crosses this horizontal line. So what, what this is saying is that if the graph starts um, if the graph starts down here and it ends up there and it's continuous, it has to uh, it has to somehow cross the blue line. And well, I can't, I mean, I can't draw a thing that is continuous and doesn't cross the blue line. <clears throat> so, um, This doesn't look like my picture. Uh, so, does this sound silly? Does it sound silly? I mean, it probably should sound silly. Um, I think. I think before before today, before September twenty fourth, twenty twenty. Uh, you're, I think you're all at least 17. I think 
for the previous uh, most years of your life, so you knew that if a path starts on one side of a line and ends in another side of a line, it, it crosses the line at some point. Um, so why do we call this a theorem? When I was, when I took calculus, um, this they called Bolzano's theorem, and Bolzano is a guy who lived in the 19th century. So does this mean that, uh, does this mean that uh, in the 18th century people didn't know that this was true? I don't think so. I think they didn't know what a continuous function was. So the thing, so why this theorem is something we bother saying is, well, first of all, we can prove it, although we don't, um, but someone can. I don't think the textbook even has a proof. Uh, but also, the, th the thing is, I'm, I've been telling you that continuous functions are things that you can draw without lifting your, your pen from the paper. But you've been taking my word for it, or at least no one has complained. And that's not what a continuous function is. A continuous function is a function such that the limit at every point Um, at every at every point is the value of the function, and, and it's not that clear that that's a function that that's what agrees with our intuition. But this theorem sort of tells us that it is um, a function, a, a continuous function, that is, is the kind of thing that can't cross a line. So. Um, I should tell you, I should say, um, it's essential for the function to be continuous. So even, it, it has to be continuous everywhere at the, um, everywhere in the, in the interval, because if it misses one single point where it's not continuous, then uh, already the theorem is not true. Here's a here's a, an example where you have f of a and f of b, and n is in between, and there's no there's no point in the graph uh, at height exactly n, or at the end points you could you know you could have something like this. Here the function is continuous in the whole interior of the interval, but not at A, and that messes everything up. Basically, if the function is not continuous, there's, there's just no way this is gonna work. I mean, it might work if you're lucky, but um, doesn't work at all. This seems obvious. Um, it seems, um, <clears throat> it seems obvious right now, but if you're not drawing the function, you might you might not realize that there's a nasty point in between that you're that you're you're missing, and and then you're you're trying to apply the theorem and get a wrong answer. So, um, are there any questions on what the theorem says? Um, You did say good morning, so I assume you didn't go back to sleep. I always have that suspicion. So if there are like multiple, like there will be like, there can be multiple intermediate like values. Yes, um, that's a good question. Uh, wh when I say there, there is some, I mean, there exists uh, one, but if I'm saying there exists one, that doesn't mean that there, uh, that there couldn't be more. Uh, you know, think like if I say, um, this person is hiding an illegal offshore account in Panama, and it turns out that they're hiding five illegal offshore accounts in Panama. I wasn't, I wasn't lying because there were five and not one, right? So. Uh, 
Um, so, for example, you know, the function could go like this and you cross it uh, nine times. Or you could even, it could even, it could even be an infinite number of times. You could, you could even have the function, it could become just completely horizontal for a while, and then you have infinitely many values to choose from. So the theorem has no idea how many times it's going to be. It just tells you it's going to be at least one. So we can, um, we can use this to give, um, to, to reach non-stupid conclusions. Um, even though it's a very it's a very simple idea, but um, so we can solve an equation that so find a number such so, that such that when you take the fifth power you get a one more. Um, so this is something that you don't know how to solve. I am certain of that. You don't know, you know a formula or you, you know you know that at some point in your life you knew a formula for degree two equations. Uh, and even if you don't remember, you could look it up. Uh, and there is a formula for degree three equations and degree four equations. And there is no formula for degree five equations. Um, and it's not just that nobody knows a formula is that we know that there cannot be a formula. So this is exciting. This is, this is impossible. And yet we're about to do it. So, um, I'm not gonna, so the thing is, I don't have an exact answer, but who cares, uh, for, for everything in life, basically, if you, if you give enough decimals, you're happy enough. So, I can definitely give a bunch of decimals. So what am I going to do? I'm going to, um, let's write it as, let's look at this function. If I, if I look at this function, what I'm looking for, I'm looking for X such that F of X is zero. So, um, <clears throat> this looks like the, by the way, this looks like the answer to the intermediate value theorem. There is some C for which F of C is whatever I want. Um, here, the whatever I want is, is zero. Um, so, let's guess a number. Someone guess a number. Right. Um, I'm going to take the calculator. So what's f of 8? 8 to the 5 minus 8 minus 5 is 32,759. So um, good guess. Uh, you were, uh, you were, that's, um, That's, uh, the answer was bigger than zero there. So, can I, so what's another guess? Four. Okay. Um, four to the fifth minus four, minus one. All right, still bigger than zero, getting closer. Zero, oh, all right. All right, that's enough. Uh, zero point five, negative one, negative two. Um, let's do all of them. Zero point five to the fifth minus zero point five minus one. All right, so that's negative. Closest guess so far, negative one. Careful with the brackets. Minus negative one. Well, I could do it without the calculator. Um, 
and a negative two to the fifth minus negative two minus one negative thirty one. Okay, so um, what did I just figure out? So I think the closest ones were so uh, f of four was um, a number of a thousand, so it was positive, and f of zero point five was um, negative one point four. So it's negative. So um, so that's all. That, that's that's all I need. So this function at zero point five, it's below the the x-axis, and at four, it's well above the 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 x-axis. So the intermediate value theorem, since it's continuous, it's continuous everywhere. So I don't need to worry about that. Since it's continuous, um, the intermediate value theorem says there is a C for which um, f of C is zero. And C is going to be between 0 0.5. Not only do I know that there is one, I know that it's a number between 0 0.5 and 4. So, I guess I know the answer to some precision, maybe not a lot of precision, but now, what do I do if I want more? Uh, well, I just keep guessing. So, the answer I'm looking for is between 0.5 and 4. So, let's guess a number between 0.5 and 4. One, two point five. All right. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this faster. Um, X to the fifth minus six. Oh no, don't graph it though. Because if you graph it, it gives it away. <clears throat> okay. Uh, F of one. F of one is negative. So. Uh, now I know that the answer, at least, you know, there could be more, but uh, in the future we'll learn why, um, we'll learn uh, how, to, how to know if there's only one answer. But for now, we don't know, there could be more than one, but uh, I know at least there's one between one and four, because at one it's negative and at four it's positive. So next, so something in between there is uh, 2.5, I'm going to try two. Two uh, gives me a, a positive number. So now I'm looking between one and two. So I'm gonna keep guessing numbers between one and two. 1.5 gives me a positive number. So now I'm between one and 1.5. One point five. Uh, so uh, I know at one, at one I'm at negative one. And at two, I'm, I'm positive. At 1.5, I am uh, still positive. So let's keep trying. Let's do f of 1.2. f of 1.2 is positive, but I'm getting closer. Now, now my face is in the way. There's so many, so many, uh, so many zoom buttons in the way. Okay, 1.1, 1 .1. 1 .1 gives me a negative number. So now the answer is between 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2. So 1.15, that's negative, so I need to go higher. So hopefully you'll see how this goes. 1.16, and when, when does this end? It ends when I get bored, or it ends when I'm satisfied that I got a, a close enough answer. So now I'm between 
Isn't there like a formula you can use instead? No, the point is that there isn't. There, there's just like nobody in humanity has a formula for this. So like, is this just for this particular problem there's no formula or like, is this for any situation where we use the intermediate value here? So just most equations, you don't have a formula to solve. Like if I, the thing is, if I ask you to solve, so if I ask you to solve this, you, you have a formula for that. Or if I ask you to solve this, you have a formula for that. But if I ask you to solve this, I'm pretty sure you don't have a formula for that. If, you know, if I start writing random equations, um, it's just, you, you don't have formulas for most things, but yet we can solve them by, I mean, we can solve this by doing this, which is just a little bit smarter than guessing. Uh, but I mean, I think the only kinds of equations you have a formula for are these, and then some kind of very specific ones. Like, you know, if I tell you sine of x is one half, then you know how to solve this. But if I tell you that sine of x is one third, so because this is x equals um, 30 degrees. But if it tell you a sign of x is one third, you don't you don't know the exact answer to this. But uh, doing this, for example, you could give it to um, you could get as many decimal sites as you would like. So, um, I mean, most of your life you've seen equations that you were able to solve um, because they were homework from your high school. But, but uh, in real life, uh, equations are a lot more like, like the random crap that I was uh, writing. Okay, so my guess right now, can I get one more decimal? One, 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 six, seven, three is negative. F of 1.1674 is positive. So I know four decimal numbers uh, for decimal places now. And you know, um, if I actually wanted to do this, I would, I would write a program to do it. Or I mean, there are programs that do this. There are better ways to, to approximate equations than this. This is kind of the, the least cool way. Um, soon we'll know a much, 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 much faster way. And that would take would have taken like three steps to get to this point, but this is good. It works. So, so when we're trying to find like the intermediate one, do we have to like get as close as possible to like the value? Like, uh, I mean, as close. I think as close as possible would take you an infinite amount of time. And I mean, an infinite amount of paper at one point, at some point you're just writing 20 decimals every time. Um, you know, if I was giving you a problem, I would say find two decimals. I would, I would specify something like that. Maybe I would just say, show that there's a solution between one and two, something like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm committing right now to not giving you problems that take an infinite amount of time. And if this was a real life problem, then it's up to you to decide when to stop. You know, there, like, I mean, that could be a complicated question depending on the problem. <clears throat> so, um, so this is how you can solve. So now, so before you knew how to solve just very few equations. Um, you basically, you knew how to solve quadratic equations and that was it. Now you can approximate the solution to every equation in the world, basically, as long as it's even by continuous functions, which most of them are, which I think is pretty cool. 
So you can disagree with me on that. Are there more questions? All right. So um, that's all I have to say about uh, continuous functions. That means uh, I'm moving on to um, to section two point six, which is uh, limits at infinity. So um, so I think you have a pretty good guess of what this is going to be. Um, what is, um, so here's an example similar to what we were doing when we started talking about limits. You take a function, you can take, for example, this function and And I'm asking what happens to this function when x gets very large. So, um, I guess back to the calculator. Maybe I'll open a new one. So, minus one divided by x squared plus one. So, um, so what's a very big number? 10 or I, no, let me start with one. F of one is zero. I knew that. F of two is 0 0.6, three, 30. So, um, a pattern appears very fast as you put in bigger and bigger numbers where clearly the values of the function are approaching something. Um, so, um, so I would say the function has a limit and that limit is, that limit really looks like it's one. I'm pretty sure if I put a big enough number, I can convince it that it's exactly one. In this case, it's not gonna be exactly one. This number, it's a, the numerator is always smaller than the, the denominator. So I know this number has to be smaller than one, but there are so many decimals, which are nines, that it just rounds it up to one eventually. So this function is approaching uh, one. Uh, so if I take f of 30, it's 0.99. A, if we take f of 400, it's 999.87. If I take 10,000, it's 0.9999998. So, um, these values sure look like they're approaching one. Uh, I, I really want to say that the limit as x approaches infinity of this function is one. Uh, so, what is the limit? What what is the limit at infinity? So, take a take a function. So, first of all, to talk about a function. Um, to, to talk about, that's not gonna work, that's a little type it. To talk about a function, about an infinite limit, we need to have a function that's defined close to infinity, I guess. Um, to talk about, so the limit at infinity is about so many very large numbers. So F needs to be defined for very large numbers. The a function,
that is defined. Um, at some interval on, on, over, about. I said on and wrote in, that's great. On, on some interval that goes all the way to infinity, because otherwise, can't even talk about this. Um, we say, The limit of F as X approaches approaches um, positive infinity, or oh, you know, if you just say infinity, probably mean positive um, is L. If I can. make um, the value as close to x as, I, uh, as close to l as I want for very big x as close to l as I want or uh, when I take x's that are now not before so limited at a point a that I was talking about before, I, I need to make f of x close to the limit as I make x close to a. Uh, now, I, instead of making x close to a, it would have to be um, close to infinity, but that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Or if it does, I don't know what sense it, it makes. Um, so what I'm meaning to say is close enough, uh, large enough x. So still, I'm not saying infinity is a number. I really don't want it to be a number. Uh, but I'm saying that there is a thing, there is such a thing as taking the limit as x approaches infinity, but that just means take very large numbers. So here, uh, say I wanted, you know, I wanted the function to be between 0 0.01 of, of 1. In this example, probably taking x bigger than 30 would be would be good enough. But say I, I don't want it to be close to one with three decimals. I want it to be close to one for four decimals. When then take x bigger than 400. And then I change my mind and I say, I want it to be close to one within seven decimals. So then I say, take it bigger than 10,000. And the thing is, the thing is I can play this game and never fail. You, you tell me how many decimals you want to be, uh, nines and I can give you a number big enough such that after that point the value of the function is going to be um, is going to be close enough so what does this look like um, well the value of the function is getting close to one uh, so close to one means y is getting close to one. Um, so the, the, the graph is just getting very close to this horizontal line. Um, and at some point they become indistinguishable because uh, they're so close that I can't tell them apart. Um, because one is, what, um, the line is at height one and the, the graph is at height 0.99999. Okay. Are there any questions? Are there any, um, like, does it ever go the opposite way where it's like to negative infinity? Uh, yeah. Or so, um, yeah, that's the next thing I'm going to talk about. So, um, right. So instead of plugging in, very large numbers instead of plugging in a uh, thousand I can plug in negative a thousand so um, instead of large numbers I 
I can use uh, large negative numbers. And that would, uh, that would be um, the limit at negative infinity. So, um, if you take, take a function that is defined on some interval, on <clears throat> some interval now that contains very small numbers. So we say, oh, that's great. Oh, that's just fantastic. Um, so we say that the limit of f at negative infinity is um, is l. If the, the same thing happens, if I I can make f of x as close to l as I want by making x very large and well, large enough and that's it. It's the same, but on the left, but for negative numbers. Um, so, so this same example, well, it's an even function. Uh, when you plug in here a negative x, you you get the same you get the same answer, which means that this graph is symmetric, has mirror symmetry around the vertical line. So, the same exact same thing is happening happening on the left. So, this function as f approaches x approaches negative infinity, it also approaches one. So. We we normally we write this saying the limit as x approaches negative infinity is L. Um, so what happens in the graph? Um, well, what happens in the graph is that the function becomes indistinguishable from a line, uh, from a horizontal line. So. We call this just like vertical asymptotes are lines that get very close to a function. Um, horizontal asymptotes are horizontal lines that get uh, very close to a function. We say y equals to l. So y equals to l is the equation of a horizontal line. So we say that um, we say that this line is a horizontal asymptote. If um, if either the limit at infinity of f is l or the limit at negative infinity of f is l or or if both if both happen then i would also say it's a horizontal asymptote uh, so when this happens um when this happens you have um oops, sorry we'll go on you you have your graph that gets very close to a horizontal line and eventually you just can't tell them apart does anyone try to go to infinity maybe we're all lazy and there's a loop we'll attempt to find infinity okay should be a different chat for you all to make jokes and for me to be able to ignore okay 
um, so um, so that's a horizontal asymptote. So now we know what a horizontal asymptote is and a, and a vertical asymptote is. And lines that are not horizontal or vertical can also be asymptotes, um, but I'm not going to talk about them because it's just um, they're not that interesting. Honestly, <clears throat> so um, one thing I've noticed is that college students tend to interchange horizontal asymptotes and vertical asymptotes. And uh, I mean, I think for me, drawing a picture helps me remember which is which. But um, if you don't remember, then you just have to look it up and not confuse them, you know? So it's been a while since I make this class into a game show. So I have a poll for you. Uh, the poll is how many, how many, oh, that's, there's a, there's a, there's a typo there. How many asymptotes can a function have? So I'm asking you how many vertical asymptotes can a function have? how many horizontal asymptotes can a function have? So there's more than one answer. I mean, so if if there could be a function with zero vertical asymptotes, you should mark zero. And if there is a function with one, you should mark one. You can mark more, you can mark as many answers as, as you want. Um, for example, one person right now said infinitely many and nothing else. So for this person who is anonymous, by the way, um, it means that it's not possible for a function to have zero vertical asymptotes or to have one or to have two. Folks, oops, we'll mark that. Oh, wow. This is interesting. So you have to mark all the answers that are possible. So far, no one thinks that a function can have three vertical asymptotes. Oh, this is fascinating. No one thinks that a function can have three horizontal asymptotes. You have time. You have, you have two minutes to think about this. <clears throat> so, um, all right. So, how many vertical asymptotes can a function have? Uh, a function can have any number of vertical asymptotes. So, every every number in there was a correct answer. Um, so. If you if you mark them all, congratulations. What's a function that has uh, what's a function that has zero vertical asymptotes? Okay, so if I'm sharing the results, are you just, so, no, you can close this, right? Yeah, you can still see my screen. Okay, you can open and close them, I think, yeah. Okay, um, so, um, 
a function can have any number of asymptotes. Um, here's some examples. Um, zero asymptotes um, uh, of vertical asymptotes. Sorry, ooh, this is important. Uh, so here's a function that has zero vertical asymptotes. How about a horizontal line? It doesn't approach infinity anywhere. What's a function that has x plus one? Is another example. What's a function that has one vertical asymptote? Okay, I don't have time to stare at you. Um, one over x is a function. It approaches infinity at zero. It approaches, well, it goes to one side from the right, one from the left, but overall, only one vertical asymptote. And if I take one over x, I can, I can make a lot of functions that have Um, so what if I take, so here's a function. So this is one over X translated because I added one to the X, I subtracted one to the X that, ma that moves it one to the right. So if I add them together, I have two asymptotes. Uh, if I add a third one, guess what? I have three asymptotes. So how, how can I get 20, 20 asymptotes? Um, if I write sum in here, it lets me write a sum of things depending on n. Um, so oh, one. So this function has um, exactly two thousand and twenty vertical asymptotes. Uh, this means make n equals one, make n equals two, make n equals three. But you, the beauty of it is that you don't have to write it out. You just tell it go from one to 2020. Anyway, that's a function with, um, that's a function with a lot of vertical asymptotes. Uh, I can get one with any number I want. So, um, is this useful? Probably not in itself, but um, it means that I understand asymptotes if I know this. Or at least better than if I didn't know it. So, horizontal asymptotes uh, do not work like that. So, all right, um, less than half of you marked zero, one, and two. Um, maybe you missed the second question in the poll. So a uh, function can have zero vertical asymptotes. It can have one, it can have two, but it cannot have more than two. And it can not have infinitely many. Oh, sorry, vertical asymptotes. Infinitely many. Uh, you know, you know a function with a lot of asymptotes uh, tangent. The tangent looks like uh, this repeated a bunch of times. So there you go. Um, so you can you can have at most um, at most two uh, horizontal asymptotes. because um, because you can have. You can have a limit as x goes to infinity. You can have a limit as x goes to negative infinity. And that's it. So if, if these limits both exist and they're different, then each of them is going to give me one, uh, one asymptote. 
and that's all I can have. I can't have two different limits at the same in the same direction. So for example, the arctangent has two horizontal asymptotes. The arctangent is just is the inverse of the tangent, it's the inverse of the middle bit of the tangent. Because if I don't restrict to the middle bit, it's not one to one. So um So it approaches this line over here and this line over here. Now, I know the tangent approaches this line x equals pi over two. At 90 degrees, there's no tangent. So this line, when, when you, I flip it, I interchange the x and the y, this is the line y equals pi over two, and this is negative pi over two. So very important limit, the limit of the arctangent is pi over two, and the limit of negative infinity is negative pi over two. All right, that's it. Um, I'm gonna stop there and answer question.